uh, can India be cunning? And I, I hope in the course of my lecture you'll understand why I prefer to use the word cunning. I'll try, I, I understand I'll have to speak for about 40, 45 minutes or so. Uh, and then I, I would welcome questions. And I want to begin by emphasizing that uh, the more difficult the question, the easier the answer. So I hope you will think of the most difficult questions you can, you can think of. And, and please challenge me because that's the way we get a good, robust debate. And I think, you know, looking back at Mr. Subramanian himself and how bold and how outspoken he was uh, himself and he, he was speaking and writing and I guess, you know, he, uh, for example, as you know, he complained about nuclear apartheid in the world and he was dead right. Uh, there was nuclear apartheid in the world. There's one set of standards for nuclear powers, another set of standards for non-nuclear powers. But Mr. Subramanian would say that clearly and categorically. And I also believe uh, quite sincerely that uh, there are many reasons why India has emerged uh, as a great power, but one reason why it did is because of the hard-headed and tough-minded thinking that Mr. Subramaniam did in the course of his career and the advice that he gave uh, to the Indian government and to the Indian establishment. And I, so in my remarks today, what I hope to do is to carry on this tradition of very hard-headed, tough-minded thinking that he displayed uh, when he was writing. And I propose to divide my remarks into uh, three parts. Uh, in the first part, the key point I want to make at the beginning is uh, all nations, uh, especially all great powers, are cunning. There is no exception. And I challenge you to give me an exception if you want during the question time. Uh, and secondly, I hope the second point I want to make is that India is about to enter uh, a remarkable geopolitical sweet spot. In fact, in, the, in India, you know, the, it's almost as though the heavens are clearing and a clear path is emerging for India, especially in the next decade or two. But my biggest fear, if I'm being very honest with you, is that India will sail into this geopolitical sweet spot and then sail right out of it without taking advantage of it. So that I see as a big danger. So that's why I thought, you know, this is the time, if there's, a, if there's ever a time for India to be cunning, this is the moment for cunning. And so I then finally end my lecture, uh, uh, in the third part, with a description uh, of some examples of how India can be cunning in taking advantage of the geopolitical sweet spot. So that's the structure of the lecture into three parts. And let me, let me begin with the key point I said at the beginning, which is that all nations are cunning. And we shouldn't be surprised by that, because, you know, nations are not human beings. You know, they don't have this, the same kind of uh, moral dilemmas that we human beings as individuals do, because they are made, all nation states are designed to take care of their interests. So they will pursue their interests no matter what it takes. And to give you a graphic example of this, you know, in, in the course of my 33 years in the Singapore Foreign Service, of course, I experienced uh, great shocks. But uh, one of the most shocking moments in my life came in way back in 1982. And this was, at the, of course, at the height of the, as you know, at the uh, Cold War. And there were these disputes over uh, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, disputes over the Vietnamese invasion of uh, Cambodia, or Kampuchea, I think it was called. And in New York, in 1982, when I was there, uh, there was a conference being held, an international conference on Cambodia, to discuss the future of Cambodia uh, if we succeeded in removing the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia, what would happen to Cambodia? And there were, at that conference, a big argument developed between China and the ASEAN countries. But the Chinese government, surprisingly, took the correct position under international law. Under international law, if an invading army leaves a country, the preceding government returns to power. But the problem in Cambodia was that the preceding government was a Khmer Rouge government. And nobody wanted Pol Pot to come back. So the ASEAN countries said, hang on a second, whatever international law says, nobody in the world wants Pol Pot to come back, 
nobody wants the Khmerus to come back. They will be terrible to push the Khmer people back into genocide after the Vietnamese army leaves. And the argument between China and ASEAN in 1982 became very ferocious. And it got so bad that the United States decided to intervene. And I must say, as a Singapore diplomat and as an ASEAN, we were delighted that the United States decided to intervene because we said, United States is the beacon of human rights and democracy. Of course, the United <coughs> States will support ASEAN and say that you can never, we, United States, will never allow the return of Pol Pot, right? That's what you think the United States will do, right? No. That's what I expected. And you know, I was present in the room myself, personally, when Alexander the Hague, Alexander Hague, the Secretary, Secretary of State, said to my foreign minister, Mr. S. Danapar, said, the United States has vital interests in its relations with China. Good. We would like you to step aside and stop opposing the Chinese position. If I was not in the room myself, I would never have believed the story. But I was there. And Alexander Haig said, Mr. Foreign Minister, if you do not stop opposing the Chinese, I'm going to call your Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and you get into trouble. And I was so impressed by my foreign minister, Mr. Dara Balan. He said to Secretary Haig, please go ahead and call Mr. Lee. And of course, the Americans never did. And this is now on record. And Nayan Chanda has written about this. I have written about this in my first book, Get Asians Think. I tell that story because if you tell me <coughs> that there are countries that will put moral values ahead of national interests, I will tell you the record doesn't show that. And this is true <coughs> of basically, as I said, for every country. In the case of the United States, you know, the way that the United States has been remarkably cunning is how even today we all respect the United States, and deservedly so, by the way. You know, I, I respect the United States. And I think it's a great society. But people forget that if you look at it just purely mathematically, the United States has kept more dictators in office than any other country has. You know, you can start, we can create a long list. You can include uh, President Suharto of Indonesia, Marcos of Philippines, uh, Mobutu of Zaya, and of course, as you know, Ziaul Haq of Pakistan. Because why? It served American interests to do so. So it doesn't matter whether if you're a beacon of human rights and democracy, if it serves your interests, you do that. In the case of uh, China, I can tell you, and I mean this as a compliment, of course, that the Chinese probably have the most cunning foreign policy in the world. And they have a remarkable ability to take advantage of opportunities and win more kudos in the process. Again, in my book, The New Asian Hemisphere, and again, I can tell this is a personal story because I was there one-on-one. -on -one. You know, as you know, the United States invaded Iraq in March 2003. Invasion was not a problem, it went very quickly, but suddenly a month or two after the United States invaded Iraq, uh, it discovered, to its surprise, that, hey, because the previous Security Council sanctions were still in place, and as you know, the United States tried to get endorsement for the Security Council to evade it up, it failed, therefore the previous sanctions were still in place, and the United States wanted to export Iraqi oil to help the Iraqi people, it couldn't because the Security Council sanctions were in place. So the United States had to work very hard to lift the sanctions that had been applied while Saddam Hussein was in power, and at that time, as you know, the Security Council was very divided, and so on and so forth. Finally, I think, I forget, in June or July, the sanctions were lifted. And on the day when the sanctions was lifted, 
because Singapore had been serving the Security Council 2001-2002, I met the chief American negotiator one-on-one -on -one for a cup of tea on the day. So I said, hey, tell me, who helped you get this resolution through? Who helped America to get the resolution we wanted on Iraq? And I thought that he would say United Kingdom or France or Germany or some friend of the United States. And lo and behold, to my surprise, he said, Kishore, China helped us. And the Chinese were absolutely brilliant with that move because on the one hand, and I can confirm this as a fact, they got an immediate short-term reward because President George W. Bush was so grateful that China helped him get the resolution, he then literally, and I'm not saying, I'm, it's not metaphorically, he literally squeezed Chen Shui Bian, the then leader of Taiwan who was trying to push for the independence of Taiwan. So the Chinese got an immediate geopolitical reward. Taiwan got squeezed, China benefited. But that was peanuts, because the real long-term reward that the Chinese got because they were very eager to legitimize the American presence in Iraq. They said, be our guest, stay as long as you want in Iraq. Spend 10 years there, because 10 years gave China the time to rise peacefully, while America got distracted in Iraq. I mean, that's what I call cunning of the first order. The Americans actually thanked them for helping them to stay in Iraq. And the Chinese got the rewards. Ten free years while America got distracted. So this is an example of geopolitical uh, cunning. And of course, you know, and I'll come to this later, the United Kingdom and France, to mention two other permanent members of the UN Security Council, have been equally cunning in keeping their places in the Security Council. You know, as I said in my article, somewhat un, somewhat undiplomatically, I guess I'm no longer a diplomat now. I said UK and France have gone by their sell by date as great powers, you know. They've expired, the sell by date expired a few years ago, and if they were honorable, decent individuals, they would retire from the Security Council. It's meant for great powers of today, or great powers of tomorrow, or great powers of yesterday. But you know, they will never do so. <coughs> but to keep their seats in the Security Council, they've done a brilliant job of supporting Germany's participation in the UN Security Council. And why is that brilliant? Because the Germans are very grateful that UK and France are supporting them. But the UK and France, by trying to push in another third European member into the Security Council, are killing Security Council reform. Because two is really too many. Getting three means it's impossible to Security Council reform. That's another example of being cunning. And, um, uh, and if you look at other countries, and I, I can give you other examples, and I hope you'll you think of other examples of me too. Look at a country like Japan. Japan is a remarkable country, you know, in sense, especially since World War II, the most peaceful, uh, no involvement in conflicts, no wars, and you think this is the most peaceful, pacifist country in the world, a role model for all of us. And the Japanese have been brilliant. They've convinced all the world that they're very peaceful, very focused on peaceful development, and they've quietly developed a nuclear capability without anyone complaining. So today, if Japan decides to go nuclear, some people say it may take one year, others say six months, others say two months, some say two weeks. They have everything in place. And no one is speaking about it. That's also cunning to achieve that. And the Iranians wish they could be as cunning as the Japanese. But they can't, obviously. So these are, these are examples that I give you of nation states. But one, one very key point I want to make here is that the reason why the word cunning causes discomfort to your friends, uh, Sanjaya, is that they assume that if you are cunning, you are by definition evil. You cannot be good and cunning. That's the perception of the world. Yeah, I can tell you one of the best things I ever did in my life when I was a student of philosophy was to take a course on Machiavelli. And if you do a course on Machiavelli, 
and my professor actually was a brilliant professor in Canada, Halifax, Nova Scotia, David Bruebro. And he taught us that the goal of Machiavelli was to promote what is an Italian word, virtue, V-I-R-T-U, similar to virtue. His goal was to make the citizens of his city happy and better off. But he said to achieve that goal, sometimes you have to use means that are not necessarily moral. But the goal is moral. And so, in many ways, quite often, if you want to achieve moral goals, you have to be cunning. And there are many instances where more good moral ends have been achieved through being cunning. And to give you a simple, clear example, as you know, 20, 30 years ago, when people were looking at flashpoints in the world, where is war likely to break out, you know, as you know, probably years ago, it would be between India and Pakistan, between North Korea and South Korea, and so on and so forth, right? And one really hot flashpoint, until 1995 or so, was the Taiwan Straits flashpoint between China and Taiwan. <coughs> and there were some very tense moments, and as you know, the Chinese launched some rockets in the mid-1990s and so on and so forth. But today, the danger of war there is not quite zero, but getting <coughs> What happened? How did we get rid of this prospect of war? We got rid of this prospect of war because the Chinese were very cunning. They continued to isolate the Taiwanese government, punishing governments that recognize Taiwan, but they cultivated the Taiwanese people. So they didn't, they didn't confuse the two, and they opened the doors to the Taiwanese, they opened the doors to Taiwanese investment, they encouraged trade, and today you have almost a million or two million Taiwanese in China. And the trade has exploded. And now even Chinese are being allowed to visit Taiwan. Now that is remarkable. This was a very dangerous flashpoint. But through sheer cunning, the Chinese <coughs> solved it. And this is why I say <coughs> it's important to be cunning in international relations. If you want to achieve good ends, you got to do, you got to do find cunning ways to do it. Now all this brings me to the second part about China, uh, you know, India's geopolitical sweet spot. And I can tell you that if you look at in terms of where we are in terms of history, the opening for India has never been better. And why is this so? It's because we are at a peculiar crossroads of history. And we are at a point in history we are seeing the end of a certain era and the emergence of another era. <coughs> what era is ending? We are seeing the end of the era of Western domination of world history. Now I hasten to add that the end of the era of Western domination of world history is not the end of the West. <laughs> the West will remain very strong and powerful for a long time to come. But the capacity of the West to dominate the world is gone. I mean, just imagine there was a time when a small country like Portugal, with a population of 4 million, who go and conquer South America, you have Brazil, conquer Africa, you have Angola and Mozambique. And amazingly, this small country of Portugal could take a bite of India in Goa, and a bite of China in Macau. How did a small country do that? Superior science and technology that the West accumulated. Right? Today, can the West do that? Can any Western country take a bite of India or China? No way. That era is gone. And it's actually quite remarkable that there's a very small population in the West. And the West, I believe, only provides 12% of the world's population. It's amazing how they could 
dominate the world for 200 years. But that domination is disappearing, and you're seeing the re-emergence re of Asia. I call it the re-emergence of Asia because from the year 1 to the year 1820, for 1800 of the last 2,000 years, the two largest economies in the world were always China and India, as the British historian Angus Madison has pointed out. And it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off and America took off. But the last 200 years of world history, when you view it against the past 2,000 years of world history, have been a major historical aberration. And so it's quite natural that all historical aberrations come to an end. And so you see the return of Asia. And it's going to happen sooner and faster than anybody conceives. And indeed, just to illustrate how fast it is happening, in 1980, in purchasing power parity terms, United States share of the global GNP was 25%, and China's share was 2.2%. Less than 10% there of the United States in 1980. Come 2019, five years from now, the United States share will fall to about 17%, and China's share will rise to 18%. And it will keep on rising, and by 2030, China's GNP in PPP terms will be twice that of the United States. So you're seeing this remarkable shift of power happening. And as it happens, it is quite natural. It's perfectly natural for the West to feel concerned about the loss of its power. And managing decline, even relative decline, is very difficult and very painful. So the West is looking for countries to balance China. That's logical. So it's, a, it's geopolitical logic probably comes from Mahabharata uh, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. And as they look around the world, which country in the world has the geopolitical weight to balance China. Can't be Japan. Japan's population today is 127. It will go down to about 100 million in 2050 and to 67 million, I'm told, by 2100. 20, the population is going to half in the next 70 years. That's not going to be a weak balance for China. So they look around the world, and quite naturally, the obvious candidate is India. And, you know, if you want to know why India secured the nuclear deal with the United States, I'm sure it was a result of brilliant negotiations on the part of Indian diplomats. I have absolutely no doubt. But if China had not emerged, it would have been much, much harder to get a deal. Geopolitics changes everything. And that's just one example of an opportunity that's come the way uh, of India. And uh, at the same time, and this is, this is a much more delicate point, and you can of course get a sense of what Western fears are by reading the book that was a bestseller in the early 1990s by my good friend who's passed away to uh, uh, Samuel Huntington, the author of The Clash of Civilizations. And as you know, in that book, he speaks about the two big threats that the West faces, and the two big threats are China and Islam. So if you live in the West today, if you're a geopolitical thinker, and you're concerned about the long-term challenge from China, and the short-term challenge from the jihadist movements that you get, and you're looking around the world and say, hey, who can we turn to for help? Who can we turn to and work with? Again, the answer is India. So the courtship of India will begin ferociously in, in the next decade or so. And the big question is, how do you take advantage uh, of this uh, courtship that is coming? And this is where, I guess, uh, my point about cunning is so important. There will be. And I, maybe I'm aware there's a big debate going on in India about this. 
there will be a very strong temptation to say, <coughs> hey, why not? India is a democratic society. Europe is a democratic society. America is a democratic society. Why don't we, the world's democracies, get together and work together to contain China? That's a possible option. But I suspect that if you choose that road, you'll get far less benefits than choosing an alternative road. Because if you choose that road, and if the West decides it can take India for granted, you will get far less geopolitical dividends. Good. Because dividends are not given on the basis of friendship. Dividends are given on the basis of interest. And paradoxically, the more independent India's foreign policy becomes, the more dividends it will get from the West. The more the West can take India for granted, the less dividends it will get. And I guarantee you this is a fact. And so, the best way, if you really want to be very cunning, and get the maximum amount of dividends from the current geopolitical sweet spot is to work to achieve a very good relationship with China. Because the closer your relationship with China, the more valuable you become as a geopolitical asset. That's the paradox. So there are many areas in which China and India actually share common interests. Let me mention a few. One, in terms of economic development, both China and India still have very large populations that haven't achieved middle class status. The priority of Xi Jinping over the next 10 years is to focus on economic development. The priority of India is to focus on economic development. So you both have a common interest in keeping all geopolitical flames flying low. When it comes to climate change negotiations, as you saw in Copenhagen, China and India have a common interest in making sure that the West doesn't put the burden of saving the world from climate change on the emerging powers of China and India rather than the previous powers. And the, the lines are very clear. In, in Copenhagen. And I can go on. There are many other areas where there are common interests within the two. So, paradoxically, at a time, as you know, when the West is getting nervous about China, the best thing that India can do is to develop this close relationship with China. And, as I mentioned, the Chinese are also geopolitically very shrewd. The more they see the courtship of India by the West, the more they'll make an effort to ensure that they keep India happy too. And so, whatever you, and I, and I know there are lots of difficulties, there's a border situation and so on and so forth, they will find ways and means to keeping these things under careful management. But mistakes will be made, okay? As you know, the latest border incident I don't know what, what level the Chinese decision was made. Some stupid Chinese commander made a decision, as you know, to park a tent in territory that was disputed. And that was a mistake. Fortunately, that mistake was solved. More mistakes will happen. The question is how you develop the capacity to handle them. And so the more, the more you have closer relationship, the greater the capacity to handle these situations. <coughs> That's just one example of cutting out. Let me, let me come, since I see I'm looking at my watch, uh, it's already 40 minutes. Let me come to the third part of my remarks about how India can take advantage of the geopolitical sweet spot in two ways. Uh, 
first thing is that I think some of you may have read an article which I published in the Indian Express today. And as you know, everybody agrees that the UN Security Council permanent members should belong to today's great powers, and as I said, not to yesterday's great powers. And India today clearly is a great power of the day. In PPP terms, your GNP is already number three in the world. You deserve a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. So India's claim for a permanent seat is legitimate. But the question is, how do you get that permanent seat? And as you know, so far, India has been working with three other aspirant states, Brazil, <coughs> Germany, and Japan, the G4 group. And frankly, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it may have been a good thing to work with Brazil, Germany, Japan, and so on and so forth. But having to serve as a UN ambassador for over 10 and a half years, and having uh, been engaged in Security Council reform for a long, large part of that period. In fact, I used to participate in the meetings of the, what was called the Open-Ended Working Group on Security Council reform. But, you know, many years went by, nothing happened. So, uh, you know, then people said, we should just change the name of the, uh, the Working Group from Open-Ended Working Group on Security Council reform to Never-Ending Working Group on Security <laughs> Council reform. And it could very well become never-ending working group on Security Council reform because years could go by. Because those who are opposing Security Council reform are being very cunning. Because, you know, the, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, UK and France are supporting Germany. In theory, Germany should be grateful to them. In practice, they are blocking Security Council reform. Uh, in the same way, uh, China, as you know, is blocking Japan's entry because of the poor relations within the two countries. But uh, when, the, when the Chinese launch a campaign to block Security Council reform, right, the United States, in theory, supports Japan's entry into Security Council. In practice, they supported the Chinese campaign. And I can tell you in my latest book, The Great Convergence, thanks to WikiLeaks, I found a quote by Zalme Khalizat, the former American ambassador to the UN. And he said, I mean, this is the height of cynicism in some ways. He said, let us talk anger against the veto. Because the more anger we stoke against the veto, the more the countries of the world will not want to give the veto to anybody else. So those who have it can keep it, but nobody else can get it. And this is on record, he said it. This is, this is what I mean about cunning. So the question is, if all the players are being very cunning in Security Council reform, how can India be equally cunning? And the answer is that the only way you're going to get Security Council reform is if you can persuade Latin America and Africa to join it. Because Africa has got 53, 54 votes. Latin America has got 35 votes. You have to give them a stake too. So clearly, you have to have a Latin American candidate. Luckily, Brazil is clearly the outstanding one. And uh, in, from Africa, it'll probably be either Nigeria or South Africa. My guess is that it'll be Nigeria at the end of the day because Nigeria's population is three over three times that of South Africa. <coughs> and in the case of Asia, if you already have China as a Security Council member, and then you ask the rest of the world to accept two more Asian states, India and Japan. They'll say, excuse me, three Asians is too many. We can take two, but not three. So the choice will be between India and Japan. So ironically, by India and Japan working together, both are effectively killing each other's possibility for entry. So that's why you need a new formula. So the formula I propose is that you have seven new permanent members. The seven permanent members will be the three old ones. United States, Russia, China. You cannot remove them. UK and France will combine together into a single European <coughs> seat because the, in theory the European Union has a single foreign policy. And the three new seats will be Asia for India, uh, Latin America for Brazil, and uh, Africa for Nigeria, South Africa, probably Nigeria. Seven permanent seats. But the re one reason why Security Council reform hasn't happened, and I know this for a fact, 
is that for every new permanent member that wants to come in, there's a neighbor that says, why not me? <laughs> right? So, for example, you in, for Brazil that wants to come in, Argentina says, why not me? For Japan that wants to come in, South Korea says, why not me? For the India that wants to come in, Pakistan says, why not me? But the, I must say the best uh, story was told by the Italian ambassador to the UN, uh, Paolo Fulci, when I was there. Because at that time, when I was ambassador to the UN, Germany and Japan were pushing very hard to get in to become permanent members. So one day, in exasperation, Paolo Fulci stood up and said, why are you just pushing for Germany and Japan to join the as permanent members? We, Italy, we lost World War II also. <laughs> <laughs> so we also fought <laughs> It is a true story. <laughs> so you can see the jealousy of what you call the also ranks. So, so the solution, therefore, I have proposed is that you have seven permanent seats and seven semi-permanent seats. And the seven semi-permanent seats are, lo are, are, are rotated among the 28 next most powerful states ranked by GNP in population. And I have a table in my book that explains what, how the state is selected. So countries like Argentina, Pakistan, South Korea, uh, uh, Germany or Japan or South, anyone, those who don't make it as permanent members get an automatic seat in the Security Council every eight years. Every fourth term, they come back automatically. So this gives an incentive to the, lo the, the, the losers like Pakistan. If, if, in the case of Pakistan, if, for example, if India becomes a permanent member, Pakistan loses everything. It gets nothing in return. But if you give pa Pakistan a semi-permanent seat, they come back every four terms, they say, okay, I get something too. So, and this way is also good because, as you know, in the international order, we have at least three classes of states. We have the great powers, we have the middle powers, and the small states. The middle powers, therefore, also now get a stake in the Security Council. And if they get a stake, they therefore have an interest in joining the Security Council reform. So this is what I mean about being cunning. You give the losers something also, and then they will support your entry into the Security Council. <coughs> and this is, by the way, this is not rocket science. This is all fairly elementary common sense. But of course, common sense sometimes is, is quite difficult uh, in international relations, as you know. But if you look at it, there can be a solution. And the reason why I propose 777 is because 7 plus 7 plus 7 is 21. And the reason why that number is important is because the United States, which is the most critical player in the whole game, has said that they will never allow any expansion beyond that number. In fact, I was personally told by a former American ambassador to the UN in private, he said, sure. The United States already has enough difficulty working with 15 members of the Security Council. If you increase it to 25, can you imagine how much more difficult it will be? And that's why the United States has capped it at 2021. So that 777 formula also meets the American requirements of not exceeding 21. So this way, if you can propose a formula that works in everybody's interest, except UK and France, of course, you have to give up the seats, then you might find a solution. By the end of the day, and this is an article I have coming out in a, in a book uh, sometime this year, the, the, the painful choice that the P5 have to make is that if they do not change the composition of the UN Security Council and the P5 remain, the danger is that the Security Council will remain, but it will lose its credibility in the long run. So it is, it is therefore in the interest of the P5 at some point in time, if they want to preserve their privileges for veto, it's in their interest to reform the Security Council and improve it. And that's why, that's how the change will come uh, in due course. And the final example I'm going to give, and here I'm going to be much, much more careful. I, I realize, you know, I'm treading into very sensitive territory here. I can say this because, you know, I'm a child of the, Pakistan, of the partition between India and Pakistan. My family were Hindu Sindhis. They were living in Hyderabad, Sin, and when partition took place, they left Sindh in 1947, came to Singapore. 
So as a child, I grew up with stories about the horrors of the partition and about how painful life was and so on and so forth. So because I say that because I understand how difficult the India-Pakistan issue is. But if there's one issue where you need to apply a lot of cunning, is the Pakistan issue. Because if you use the obvious methods, you will get nowhere. And as you can see, the situation has been frozen for a long time. And here, I've, again, I've written about this. I published a column on this some time ago. Perhaps the best formula to adopt is the one that China has adopted vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, which is that the relations with the government may remain frozen, unchanged, but the relations with the people improve. And one of India's biggest strengths in the world, I mean, and the Americans boast about their soft power, but the country actually that has the most amount of soft power in some ways is India. And as you know, Bollywood is a much bigger industry than Hollywood. I, and I'm told, I've been to Pakistan only once. I went there in 2008 as a guest of the then Prime Minister Shaukat Aziz, uh, who used to be a city banker in Singapore. And that's how I knew him. Uh, I could see, as I went around Pakistan, they are acutely aware of what's happening in India, following the movies, watching them. And at the people-to-people -people level, there's a great desire to connect with Indian society. The question is, how do you facilitate the connections at the people-to-people -people level while not allowing the government-to-government -government relations to interfere with that? And that will take a lot of cunning. But I think it can be done. So at the end of the day, as I said at the very beginning, if you want to achieve a good end, if you want to achieve moral ends, the best way to achieve it is by being cunning. Thank you very much.